Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Woodstock City Council, April 4th, 2024. This hybrid meeting is being held in person here in council chambers and electronically in accordance with section 238, subsection 3.3 of the Municipal Act and section 16.6.24 of the City of Woodstock Procedure Bylaw. This meeting is being live streamed to the city's YouTube channel and recording will be posted on the city's website following the meeting. An agenda of the meeting can be found on the agendas, meetings and minutes page of the city's website. And all councillors are in attendance, so there's no virtual councillor attendance today. We had no closed session this afternoon. Any disclosures of pecuniary interest? Councillor Wismer Van Meer. Um, yes, I am going to claim a pecuniary interest with 15.8 community grant program for 2024, as I am a full-time staff member at Big Brothers Big Sisters of Oxford County. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Seeing none. Matters arising from the minutes, and I will say thanks to Councillor Lauder, who caught um, a small error in the minutes that was brought to the attention and it's already been corrected in, in online as well as in the agenda. So we're fine there. So thank you for that. Uh, looking for a motion, Councillor Tate. Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Wismer Van Meer that the minutes of the regular meeting of Woodstock City Council held on March 21st, 2024 be adopted. Thank you. Any questions? Seeing none, all those in favor? And that is carried. Additions to the agenda. Councillor Tate. Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Lauder, that the following items be added to the agenda. Delegation item 8B, Rachel Reynolds, implementation, implementation options for ARUs and special committee and advisory task force reports item 15B, Canada Day Waste Audit. Thank you. Any questions or concerns with those? Seeing none. All those in favour? That is carried. No presentations, but of course we do have delegations tonight. So at this time I would ask Jillian Demand from the Woodstock Environment Advisory Committee Initiatives and Waste Audit Study to come forward. Thank you, welcome. At least, sorry, I should have looked up. <laughs> Thank you, welcome. There we go. And I do believe we have a presentation that should appear. It's, uh, on your screen there in front of you. You can click, click on. Yeah. There. Pauline can help it beat it. And while you're getting forward for that, I'd like to ask council just to make sure we speak into our microphones. I've had a couple of people say in the recordings they can't always hear us. I meant to say that beforehand. So just bring the microphones close so everybody at home can hear us. Thank you. Perfect. There we go. Wait for Jill. All right. Uh, thank you, Mayor and Councillors. Um, myself, Elise, and Jill are here today representing the Woodstock Environmental Advisory Committee just to highlight a few of our success stories from the 2023 term, as well as our big one, our waste audit that Jillian will elaborate more after I kind of provide a brief overview for you. There we go. Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, 2023 uh, saw a few successes for our committee. Uh, last year saw the return of our SEED Library Program. It is a joint program with the Woodstock Public Library. This program was originally established by WEAC in 2016 through a Seeds of Diversity grant. Um, just for context, Seeds of Diversity is a national charity focused on protecting seed biodiversity and improving public access access to native and heirloom varieties. So essentially how it works, if you're not familiar with the program, seeds were initially donated, again, through that Seeds um, of Diversity grant, as well as uh, the local community and WEAC members. Donated seeds are verified through our committee to ensure they're, of course, labeled correctly, viable within reason, and um, not contaminated, again, with invasive uh, species. Once verified, seeds are packaged and stocked and made available to, um, at the Woodstock Public Library. Members of the public are encouraged to take seeds and grow them. Um, and of course, donate a portion back um, to the library to keep the program healthy and viable. So that was an exciting success to see that return um, this past year. 
Uh, and in conjunction with the Seed Library, WIAC and the Woodstock Public Library have organized uh, two Seedy Saturday events. They're focused on seed saving techniques and training, as well as relating home um, gardening, composting, resources, pollinator information, um, and then as well as community engagement opportunities. Our first event was held this past October with the second event held over March break. Uh, geared to all ages, the, the events bring in local experts, includes family story time, activities, music, game, and prizes. So that was fun to see that return as well. Then we're going to fast forward um, to our Canada Day event held on July 1st. Um, there, our team held a booth at the Canada Day event at the um, Southside Park. Volunteers were engaged with the public on a variety of topics, including a reminder to the public why it's important not to uh, feed the geese. This information can be found in a previous copy of the What's on Woodstock magazine, July, August edition, 2023. Um, there you can find regular WEACT updates through the What's on Woodstock magazine. Um, we regularly contribute. So then that kind of takes us to, in addition, um, volunteers conducted a waste audit, and I'm going to turn the mic over in a second. Um, and so this was our, our big initiative, and uh, to our knowledge, this was the first waste audit um, for a city-organized event. Um, and the idea was initiated from early conversation we held with the federal not-for-profit. It is Mind Your Plastic. They had approached us and uh, just kind of looking at ways that we could help um, engage the municipality in terms of waste reduction and waste reduction specifically on single-use plastic. So this kind of um, created this idea of, of uh, tackling a waste audit. And I'm going to turn it over to Jill. Thanks, Elise. So the purpose of the audit was to quantify and characterize the types of waste be currently being disposed at events held by the City of Woodstock, including the Canada Day event at Southside Park. And with that, with the results from that, we could identify opportunities for waste uh, reduction and diversion through existing or future initiatives. So the audit consisted of two, two phases. The first phase is a pre-audit survey. So that basically in, uh, involved uh, WEAC members walking around the park and noting and uh, uh, basically identifying where the waste receptacle areas were. So in total, there were 25 locations for members of the public to deposit waste. Um, uh, 19 of those 25 were just had garbage cans. Uh, one of those 25 just had recycling and five of those 25 had both garbage and recycling bins. Uh, with that pre audit survey, we also made sure that we only, the audit sample only included waste from the event. So we didn't include garbage that was already in those uh, receptacles. The second part of the audit was actually sorting through the garbage. So we had lovely WEAC volunteers, about six of us do that. Um, so we collected the waste over a six hour period. Uh, the waste was generated from the food market vendors, from the entertainment, uh, entertainment vendors, as well as members of the public. Um, we took all that garbage, we kept it, the garbage uh, that was deposited in the garbage can separate from the waste uh, deposit in the recycling bin so we could keep the, she could track that. Um, they were sorted in the categories that were uh, that are displayed here on the uh, slide. And uh, yeah, we had a fun time going through all the garbage. It was it was very memorable. <laughs> <laughs> so the results of the of the of the audit essentially everything that was uh, thrown out in the garbage, 49% of that consisted of food waste. 27% of that consisted of paper waste and 14% of the waste thrown out in the garbage stream was plastic waste. Of the plastic waste, 59% uh, of the plastics are considered, um, are considered recyclable in the city of Woodstock. So in the report that we submitted to uh, council, there are a number of recommendations. I'm gonna quickly go through them here. Um, there's 11 of them. The first one is starting immediately, the city of Woodstock should consult and follow guidelines for creating zero waste events. There's links to um, uh, guidance documents for with recommendations for municipalities to have zero waste events. So that's a first recommendation. 
The second one is starting immediately, waste recycling and compost generated at city events should be collected and weighed separately. That's to help track successive recommendations. Um, we want to make sure that whatever is implemented in terms of the recommendations, we can be like, yeah, this is working. Uh, the third recommendations in that line as well, on a yearly basis, the city of Woodstock should conduct at least one waste audit at a city event. Again, that's to tra track the successfulness of recommendations. Um, for each event, select vendors that will align with waste goals set for the event. Um, the fifth, for each event, establish a zero waste agreement with the vendors. For each event, increase availability of recyclable deposition sites to encourage patrons to properly divert recyclable materials. Say that three times fast. Um, there weren't a lot of recycling bins at the event. Uh, so just increasing those numbers will help uh, divert the waste from garbage stream. Uh, for each event, establish clear messaging of what goes where. That's always helpful and have a monitor to make sure it's clear to people at the event of what, what goes where. Um, uh, for each event, the city to provide additional drinking water stations and reusable cups. At the Canada Day event, there was one uh, a water station uh, that we noted. Uh, the 10th recommendation, city to develop a green bin program for city events. 49% of the waste thrown out in the garbage is food waste. So that's an, that's an, that's an easy, uh, low-hanging fruit kind of recommendation. And the last one, the city market events promoting low-waste or zero-waste events. That's it. That's it. Yeah. I think that's a lot. Yeah. So. <laughs> I told, I, we were told we had five minutes. <laughs> yes. Um, any questions from council? Councillor Schoenberg. Yeah, Councillor Leatherborough and myself are both on the WEAC committee, and I'll be the first one to admit I didn't sort out any garbage on Canada Day. Um, but the reason being is with the Lions Club, as you are, uh, Your Worship, Mayor uh, Jerry, the uh, Lions Club does the beer garden in Southside Park. So the one, one thing I wanted to do, mention was sort of one of the good news things that came out of it right away from Canada Day is that when Cowapalooza rolled around, uh, we decided to switch from bottles and pouring bottles into plastic cups to literally just giving away the cans and collecting the cans during the event back because you get obviously deposit money back from them and you can bring them back to the beer store. So that was the one thing the Lions Club did um, immediately. And the one one uh, note was number nine on your list that I really mm -hmm. like is the refillable water stations yeah. that everyone could bring their own sort of water bottle from home. And and there was one refillable water station in Southside Park. Maybe having three of them would be a would be a, be a nice idea for sure. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and that was the big win uh, just with simply switching from cups to giving out cans that was that was huge because there were a lot of cups um, yeah we recycled the plastic cups but then recyclable you, but you, yeah you, you, you end up with so much that's right and bottles going back to the beer store and re plastic cups that yeah really seem to be a redundancy or too much exactly yeah thank you councillor martin Thank you, Mayor Joni, through you. Um, we know that people have great intentions when they go out in public, you know, our best practices at home and how we clean out our containers and everything. But we go out into public events and some of those best practices just seem to. Uh, so I really appreciate the, the points that you're bringing in 11 fantastic recommendations. How do we, uh, so if 49% of the waste was food waste, mm -hmm. how do we ensure that uh, any food waste that is in a recyclable container doesn't contaminate other potential clean recyclables. Uh, because if someone has, you know, a little bit of ice cream in the bottom of a plastic container and they dump it into a bin that had beautiful, pristine plastic, now we have the opportunity for none of it to be viable uh, or less of it to be viable. Suggestions, thoughts on how we circumvent that? I think that's uh, a discussion with the vendors in terms of the types of containers that they offer for the food and perhaps have the actual containers as compostable so that they can just all go into the compostable stream. Um, there was a lot of that in terms of con contamination um, and we d we were separating the food from the containers so that we could have the proper weights but that that is a that is a valid comment and something that we would need to kind of work with whoever's at the event to figure out the proper way to do that but an easy thing is just to uh, talk to the vendors and have the containers as compostable so that don't have to worry about that contamination situation. Thank you. Councillor Wismer Van Meer. Uh, through the chair to the delegation. Thank you very much. I thought this report was really interesting, actually. And um, kudos to everybody that got dirty and went through that garbage, because that is uh, probably not a task 
too many folks would want to sign up for. It was a very hot day. <laughs> and to make it even better. <laughs> um, I know you mentioned um, creating zero waste events. I think it's a great idea um, to support both you know, staff here within the city as well as vendors. Do you have information packages, things that um, could be shared to start helping, you know, as events are coming forward this year to start looking at to the potential, whether we're able to go waste-free right off the hop or start working towards that. Is there information you're able to share so De that that can happen? Definitely. And that's part of the report. There are links to guidance and, and, um, basically uh, documentation that has recommendations for zero waste events so we can start there. And that we also, I forget the name, um, there's other municipalities, contacts from other municipalities that we can reach out to and they can help us pro uh, provide guidance for, for the city. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, the answer is yes, yes. Anyone else? Councillor Schoenberg. Yeah, I guess since we have the WEAC committee here right now, maybe I'd ask uh, Brian Connors in the Parks Department to sort of give a sort of a, an overview, uh, because maybe at some point in time we could do a, a discussion, of maybe a report coming from the Works Department and the Parks Department that uh, discusses some possibilities of things that could be done short term or, or long term. But maybe there's something Brian can comment on th this, because the Parks Department itself certainly cooperated very much on this uh, July 1st uh, event. Uh, your worship through to the council's question um yeah i i believe the direction um staff is in full support of um i do believe the timelines are not uh viable um we're already in the planning we're past budget stage so timelines costing there's a a staffing and volunteer uh crunch that would have to um be looked at as well um a lot of the uh, um, recycling pieces in parks um, are not viable unless someone is actually sorting, um, uh, and that takes a lot of volunteers to do. Um, just leaving out recycling, it will be contaminated, and um, it will, you know, it looks like it's recycling, but it's garbage. So it needs to be uh, dealt with in that kind of uh, fashion. So um, I do think we can get there. Um, Kristen, the special events manager, um, in her previous job, uh, did a lot to green that uh, the, her uh, previous community um, with that, and she has some really good ideas. And uh, there are both carrots and sticks for vendors, so we don't lose all our vendors, but uh, we uh, we we can certainly work uh, towards a zero uh, zero waste and uh, a much greener uh, special events. But uh, timelines. Uh, will will definitely need to be looked at. Yes, thank you for that. And I certainly know staff are in support of this, just so mm -hmm. the committee knows. Uh, this is something that has been talked about for a little while. And again, seeing the way it's already moving is very encouraging. So yeah. uh, thank you so much for doing that. I, what I found from the report was the 49% towards what Councillor Martin was referring to is how do we get rid of the the recycling aspect when we have that much food waste because we know it's going to be contaminated and i know we already deal enough with that as a city yeah with our recycling program so there's certainly some work to be done but you know they do it in other spots so we just got to figure out how it's done and budget for it accordingly uh moving forward so thank you so much if there's nothing else from anyone else sorry oh, councillor leatherborough through you, Worship. Uh, thank you for your presentation as well. Lots of uh, heavy lifting and dirty work for this. Mm -hmm. um, and forgive me, Mr. Mayor, but maybe after we could move up 15B to just kind of um, wrap in what Councillor Schadenberg asked to Mr. Connors, which is the Canada Day Waste Audit. I would have no problem with that if uh, Council doesn't see any objections. No? Okay, so this, um, no resolution... No resolution is required, as this does refer to 15B. So if we'd like to bring forward, if nobody has any more questions, Councillor Leatherborough. So moved by myself that Woodstock City Council endorses the recommendations, including the proposed timing outlined in the report, and direct staff to report on the feasibility of implementation of each of the recommendations. 
Thank you. Do we have a seconder on that? Councillor Wismer Van Meer. Any further discussion? Councillor Leatherborough. Uh, through your worship, um, just to Mr. Connors, I had reached out to him prior to today's meeting about uh, water refill stations. So there is a longstanding music festival that my family and I go to in the city of Guelph. And um, I had reached out to uh, the festival Hillside to ask about their water truck, which has various um, faucets and taps and things like that. And, and it's my understanding that the city of Guelph slash Centre Wellington owns that. So I just wanted to ask Mr. Connors if that would be included. Um, I don't know what the cost of a water truck would be. That would obviously be a capital project. Um, but if just water stations, or I think Councillor Schattenberg had mentioned multiple water stations at future events, if that would be included in this report back to Council. Uh, Your Worship, through to the Councillor's question. Uh, yes, we will look at uh, all different types of um, hydration stations and, and that for special events, including water trucks, um, its viability, the cost, everything like that to provide the information to council so that they can make informed decisions going forward. Thank you. Any further questions or discussion? Seeing none, I'll call the vote. All those in favor? None opposed. That is carried. So thank you very much, ladies, for the presentation and the whole committee. Thank them for us. Thank you. All right. Jumping back now to 8B. I'll welcome Rachel Reynolds, implementation options for ARUs. Welcome. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I am Rachel Reynolds, and after reading the report brought forward by Eric Gilbert in the planning department, I am here to speak about the current bylaws for height for accessory structures and ARUs. I will be addressing what changes would be beneficial and why and our personal experience with them. I would first like to highlight that the job of a planner is to plan development, construction and city growth while using land in the most efficient way possible, being guided by the Ontario Provincial Plan and Provincial Policy Statement. The Provincial Policy Statement is a consolidated statement of the government's policies on land use planning. It gives provincial policy direction on key land use planning issues that affect communities such as efficient use and management of land and infrastructure, the provision of sufficient housing to meet the changing needs, including affordable housing, and the protection of the environment and resources, including farmland, natural resources, and water. If the current bylaws for height and accessory structures and ARUs are not updated, the bylaw will go against every single one of those points. First being the efficient use of land. With the current bylaw, only four meters for accessory structures with an ARU would be forcing people to put multiple shorter buildings on one lot. That would mean potentially three buildings, a primary residence, a garage, and a separate ARU which in most cases would be impossible without another minor variance, given that the current bylaw for lot coverage is only 40%. There is nothing efficient about covering more green space on a lot for the sake of keeping the height lower. Sprawl does not encourage the efficient use of land in any case. The second point being meeting changing housing needs, including affordable housing. ARUs have previously been referred to as the missing middle, and that statement is absolutely correct. Unfortunately, this is where the reality of our bylaws and our personal experience comes in. We began the process of applying for an accessory structure with an ARU back in 2022. For reference, the height of the structure that we were looking to do was 5.4 meters, essentially the bare minimum that could fit an apartment that is up to code above a garage. Two years, three committee of adjustment meetings, a hired lawyer, hired planners, and $20,000 later, we finally got our variance for the building. When we started this process, we were looking forward to providing an affordable, beautiful unit for our future tenant. Now that we have an extra $20,000 to make up for on top of the cost of building the structure, we will have to charge significantly more for rent than we had originally planned. The reality is that if the planners in the city were acting in accordance with plan policy, this would never have happened. The Ontario Provincial Plan is not just allowing ARUs, they are encouraging them, as should be the city. Keeping height bylaws for accessory structures the same as they were before these policies were implemented is just not reasonable. This will drive up the cost of rent if in order to build the ARU, it costs the homeowner tens of thousands, to do tens of, thousands of dollars. Or on the other side, it will encourage people to do it illegally and avoid the battle altogether. Third, protecting the farmland and natural resources. As stated by Mr. David Creary in a previous meeting, we cannot keep gobbling up surrounding farmland. 
Absorbing surrounding farmland and building million plus dollar homes is absolutely nothing to help the housing crisis that we are in. I would also like to point out that this will preserve green space on our lots by way of solving the parking problem by allowing a higher accessory structure parking for the tenant and the homeowner could be in the garage below the ARU as opposed to on the street. In conclusion, I would like to provide a solution for your consideration. Allow the height for accessory structures within ARU to have a height of six meters as opposed to the four meters, given that the structure is subordinate to the primary dwelling. In our case, the structure that we are building is over 10 feet shorter than our primary residence. It should never have costed us $20,000 in legal fees in over two years to get the variance. This proposed solution will keep the aesthetic of neighborhoods the same while making the red tape less. I know that everyone on this council loves this city and wants everyone in it to have a warm place to lay their head at night. But the reality is our current bylaws are making affordable housing by way of ARUs incredibly difficult. You all have the power to do something about it and I really hope that you do. Thank you for your time today. Thank you. Any questions uh, of Ms. Reynolds? For presentation, Councillor Leatherborough. Uh, through your worship, no questions. Just thank you for coming forward and um, sharing your experience, lived experience when it comes to planning and ARUs and um, that it's been a long journey. So thanks for coming today. Councillor Schoenberg. If I may, I'd like to have a question for the uh, planning de department and, and Mr. Gilbert's here from Oxford County Planning. But if I could ask him a question, if somebody was to build a, a garage attached to their house with an ARU apartment above, does that change the possible heights that they could build to? That's to you, Mr. Mayor. If the garage is attached to the dwelling, then the the height restriction is the same as the dwelling. So it typically be 11 meters. Any other questions for the delegation right now? Because, of course, we'll get into that in a little bit later with discussions, unless we move it forward, of course. Um, anyone else for the delegation questions or comments no and i'll just say thank you very much i know it's been a a long journey for you and I, i've been aware of through the planning reports and everything else so thank you uh no resolution is required as well as this refers to consideration of planning reports which is 9a in the in the reports which is coming up So now we're at consideration of planning reports, 9A. Um, looking for a motion. Well, actually, yes, we'll do the report first. Mr. Gilbert? Thank you. So this report is in response to uh, an item in the housing pledge that identified uh, uh, planning staff would follow up with uh, further direction and options for amending the zoning bylaw to facilitate residential intensification. Uh, so we've looked at the, the previous changes to ARUs just came into effect uh, mid-December. So there hasn't quite been four months of those policies and provisions being in effect. So it's a little bit early to evaluate how they've worked uh, to this point. Uh, but we've had a discussion with uh, building and engineering staff and it seems that uh, usually the ARUs uh, come up against two issues. One is parking, and the second is uh, uh, building size. Uh, with respect to parking, uh, we've looked at um, other bylaws from municipalities, and about 70% uh, of them uh, do require the one parking space. Uh, some require only, some require for parking outside the downtown. Uh, there are about, uh, uh, seven or eight that do not require parking. Uh, generally, those were some of the cities that uh, received the housing accelerator fund uh, from the federal government. Uh, but uh, generally, most of the municipalities do require parking. Uh, we've also looked at uh, the areas where you could um, reduce parking. It's really difficult to do in one uh, one rule throughout, throughout for different areas because the location of sidewalks uh, eliminates where you can provide parking. Um, in older neighborhoods where you have a, a greater front yard depth, there's typically more area to provide maybe one space or two spaces or a space and a half, including the city boulevard. 
uh, to provide uh, your additional parking spaces. Um, the city, the zoning bylaw allows you to count a garage as a parking space, but it doesn't require you to keep it free of stuff. So mm -hmm. even though you count it as a parking space, it may not be able to be used as a parking space, uh, which isn't really, uh, re that's not restricted to air use. That's for, for all residential, um, residential uses. Uh, as well, uh, newer subdivisions, typically those houses are all at the minimum uh, front yard depth. So there is no space for a tandem uh, vehicle. And uh, due to the smaller lot frontages in those areas, you have a greater number of driveways. So there isn't a lot of opportunity to, um, for on, there's less opportunity for on-street parking because you have more driveways and the infrastructure is often uh, squeezed into the the right of way uh, to a greater extent. Uh, with respect to the uh, other zoning provisions, we we would uh, recommend that the the maximum driveway width uh, remain at the sixty six percent for an ARU. If you go beyond that, it it would change the character of a lot of the. Uh, established neighborhoods and as you have wider driveways you have less on-street parking availability so you have less uh, room for for visitor parking and uh, and guest parking uh, on on city streets um, if the parking requirements are, are changed for uh, air use and other residential uh, units uh, we suggest that the city would likely need to rethink the on-street parking ban in the winter because uh, the, the parking is going to go somewhere uh, for those residential units. Uh, the second uh, uh, primary barrier to the ARU adoption is size. Um, within the existing, uh, um, or within existing or new uh, buildings, the ARU size typically is less of a concern. Um, we suggest that you could bump that up from 50 to 60%, uh, but we, um, staff recommend that that 100 square meter cap remain uh, for a couple of reasons. The primary reason is that uh, if you had a, a dwelling and uh, two ARU units that would be um, greater than 100 square meters, uh, we suggest that really instead of a, a dwelling and two ARUs, that's really a triplex. Um, and the city is able to collect development charges for the triplex. Uh, if it's considered an ARU, uh, the city's wouldn't be able to charge uh, development charges for those two units, which would be about $10,000 per unit. And likely if, if it's that large, the the size is the same as the triplex. So the, you know, the rental rates may not be less uh, because the construction costs are comparable and the only savings would be the development charges that the city is missing, city and county are missing out on. Uh, with respect to, to the uh, accessory building, uh, air use in, in those buildings. Uh, there's a wide ver wide range of provisions throughout Ontario for those. Um, and really they, they reflect community needs and community characteristics. Um, generally the six meters is at the high end of a permitted height for an accessory building in a urban residential context, but that, that would facilitate uh, the second story. Um, Historically, the, the city's current zoning bylaw and the previous one uh, did not permit uh, two-story accessory buildings as of right. So Woodstock is um, has consistently not uh, permitted the two-story accessory buildings in rear yards, uh, generally for, for, for character reasons and uh, maintaining privacy in rear yards. Um, if council wishes to, to alter that, uh, we would likely bring back a report with some options, including um, restricting the location of windows, perhaps from this side lot lines to provide some, to address some privacy concerns, but it would be a significant departure uh, to, um, uh, to, to permit the, the, six, the six meters uh, for detached accessory structures. Um, but as noted, uh, those provisions are unique to each community and there is no really one one answer uh, fits all. Uh, in respect to the, the maximum size, uh, staff recommend that, that that 540 square meter minimum lot area maintained as a, when to get below that lot area on uh, infill lots, 
it's very difficult to to site accessory building as well as you have a lot of uh, grading concerns um parking concerns and uh, generally the uh, building uh, in the rear yard is out of character on the smaller lots so staff recommend that that 540 square meter um, minimum lot area for detached air use remain uh, having said that uh, staff's looking for council direction on these matters and uh, i'll try my best to address any questions thank you very much questions of mr gilbert in planning Councillor Wismer Van Meer. Uh, through the chair to Mr. Gilbert. Um, the one thing I thought that I found interesting was I spent probably a lot more time than I expected to trying to find municipalities on what their height restrictions were. Um, and it's there aren't too many that really list it. Um, the few that I did find were anywhere from four to five meters was kind of the commonality. Um, I did notice that Sault Ste. Marie was one of the few that had six meters and um, Guelph, um, the Guelph and that kind of some of the townships in that area had it listed as not exceeding height of the main dwelling. So for these ones that maybe aren't posted, is there that you're not, that we're not finding the information, are they sticking to the, what is in the guidelines of the, the, of the planning? Is it the four meters? Is it just because their bylaws just aren't posted in that way? I, you know, as, as, as I was searching and looking around, this information is not as readily available as I thought it would be. That's your Mr. Mayor to answer this question. Usually the accessory building height provisions are in the general provisions, so may not be in the R1, R2, R3 zone. Um, we looked at about, I think, 30 different municipalities. And there's a, there's, of those, there's probably about three that were six meters. Um, a couple uh, down in, in Essex region, uh, and there is a, uh, uh, I believe one in Huron County. Uh, in Oxford County, uh, generally in the, other than Thamesford and, and um, Mount Elgin, which uh, permit a little bit higher, uh, Woodstock is actually the, the, has the greatest permissions for height currently for accessory buildings. Tilsonburgs is 3.7 and I believe Ingersoll's is the same. So currently Woodstock is the highest for the, for the urban centers, but it, it is really a, case by case basis and it's based on community desires community priorities and how communities have developed in the past and just to follow up on that so the one that i was reading that said not to exceed the height of the main dwelling what kind of i mean that can look so different from different parts of our community even within woodstock but even houses within that same block so you know, one house could be taller than the one beside it. So is it, is that, that was the only one I've seen like that. Is that something that you've seen often to see that kind of, that kind of context for this? So you misread the conscious question. We've seen, I've seen ones where it's a percentage of the main dwelling height. I haven't seen that one specifically. Uh, again, the, the difficulty is that most, all of the, the residential zones permit 11 meters. So whether or not a person chooses to build to that, I mean that's 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 their that's their choice, and certainly in some cases a, a two story accessory building would be higher than a bungalow, for example. So using a you know a percentage or using cannot exceed the height of the main building, that may be a may be an option to ensure they remain in character. Any other questions from the planner? No, I think it's really important here to recognize what ARUs are. They're hopefully a form of affordable apartments of some sorts, but they're also like a, a mortgage helper these days as well to somebody to try to afford a house. So uh, I think it's important we keep that in mind when we're looking at these. And I guess I do have one question, Mr. Gilbert, to you. Sorry, I just thought of this. The way it is now, let's say nothing changes and I'm it's like a Miss Reynolds uh, property. Could would it look like the uh, committee of adjustments, or it, they would come back and look at this property and then decide from there that in this one case higher fits in the neighborhood and would be allowed, or what exactly? So council knows are we going to be looking at right now? Are we setting saying no heights restrictions at all, or we're still going to be able to be um, minor variances of sorts 
Sure. So, so currently the, the height is the three, the four meters. Mm -hmm. So if you have a proposal that exceeds that, there is an option going to committee of adjustment. The application fee is $800. It generally goes to a meeting within four weeks and then uh, there's a decision on it. And in, in that case, the committee, you know, disagreed with the planning staff. They decided that the, uh, it was a, a larger lot, a corner lot, and it did fit in with the surrounding neighborhood. So there's consideration for, for those circumstances and that's through a committee of adjustment generally. Okay, thank you. Any other further questions before I let them sit down now? <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Uh, looking for a motion then on the floor. Councillor Lederborough. Moved by myself that Woodstock City Council directs staff to initiate amendments to the city's zoning bylaw to provide for a maximum accessory building height of six meters. And further that Woodstock City Council directs staff to initiate amendments to the city's zoning bylaw to provide for an increase in the maximum percentage an ARU may occupy to 60% of the gross floor area of the principal dwelling. Thank you. Do we have a seconder on that? Councillor Martin? Discussion? Councillor Leatherware? Um, I'll keep this short and sweet. Uh, very complex ARUs. Um, and certainly after reading the report, it's quite clear that uh, Woodstock's biggest challenge is parking. And I don't think um, this council uh, at this time is interested in completely waiving parking, re parking requirements. Uh, looking at the examples of the city of London, town of Oakville, town of Ajax, Kawartha Lakes that, that have no parking requirements for ARUs, I'm happy to see there's no changes to parking. So um, therefore I do feel like these are reasonable asks. Um, I also agree that ARUs can be the missing middle. Um, I do think of aging parents or those post-secondary um, youth students, whatever you want to call them, um, also offsetting mortgage costs, that uh, there is a little bit of wiggle room here, and I do think that this is that this is reasonable. Thank you. Anyone else? Councillor Martin? Yeah, I'll just add to that that uh, thank you, Mayor Accioni, that, um, you know, as we work collectively to meet our housing pledge uh, targets, this is one of the ways uh, to allow us to do that without significant sprawl. Um, I realize that every neighborhood is unique, um, but enabling people who are interested in pursuing this, whether it's for, again, those adult children or a family member, um, uh, yeah, just to create housing opportunities. Uh, six meters, in my opinion, when uh, a, a, a regular unit is 11 meters, um, still seems well within a realistic height uh, to me for an accessory dwelling. So um, I support the motion and uh, look forward to further input. Thank you. Any other discussion? Councillor Schoenberg. Yeah, through to whoever the question uh, kind of applies to mostly, just as a point of clarification, would this still include having, uh, say, a single family home with an ARU inside it, plus the detached accessory ARU? So in other words, three units on the, on the same property uh, to have that height restriction. So to be clear, the height restriction would only apply to the detached ARU. The other ones would be inside the principal dwelling. So there's no change to the, num to the number of ARUs that's that's set by the provincial, the planning act now, which is two plus the main dwelling. So three units per property. Councillor Wismer Van Meer. Um, through the chair, perhaps this would go to Mr. Gilbert again. I'm not sure, sorry, but um, if we are to um, pass this motion with the six meter height and you mentioned about um, looking at privacy potential um, of windows and such. Is that something that needs to be listed within this or is that something that comes out of the bylaw, the report, what have you, once it's, if, if it's passed? Uh, if this motion was passed, staff would initiate the, uh, the zoning amendment. And then as part of that process, we'd bring a recommendation to you uh, for this, uh, how to implement the six meters, including any other provisions that we think would be uh, appropriate. You. Anyone else? Councillor Lauder. Thank you. Um, I will not uh, be supporting the motion. Uh, we have only um, 
been uh, under these rules for four months, so they really haven't got, um, don't know the true outcome. Um, I think that we just start chipping away and chipping away that it's just changing all the time. So, um, and if we're to meet the 5,500 units, um, I was given to understand when uh, the pledge was made that we can meet the, the 5,500 with everything that we have approved to date. So the builders just have to build them. So, um, and with the six feet uh, or six meters, I should say, um, as Mr. Gilbert has said that um, we are, there's, we're, there's only a few that's at the six meter and uh, we are within what the majority of the municipalities are, um, are listed as. So um, I will not support this. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Councillor Tate. Uh, through the chair, I also will not be supporting this. Um, I agree with Councillor Lauder's comments about chipping away. Um, as everyone knows, I'm not a big supporter of ARUs as I find they destroy neighborhoods. And as you go along, it'd be, be great if it was, you know, adult children or or in-laws, but that's not actually what happens quite often. So um, I live in Woodstock for a reason. And I don't live in Guelph. I don't live in Toronto. I don't live in Hamilton. I live in Woodstock. And I live in Woodstock because of the neighborhood. People buy because of the neighborhoods. And I find that this will affect all the neighborhoods. I had people complain to me all this month about the traffic, what's going on, all the building, the infilling. Um, one comment was, I don't live in Toronto. I moved here because I didn't want to live in Toronto. And this is what this is turning into. So we pay um, extremely high taxes in this city. And for that, um, you know, I just, you move into, you, you buy neighborhoods and I just find it's going to affect neighborhood after neighborhood after neighborhood. And as the planner stated, there's very few that have this six meter and uh, I can't support it. And I'll ask for a recorded vote. Anyone else? Well, first of all, I'd like to remind council here that we're not voting on ARUs. We don't have a choice on that. ARUs are here. That's dictated. It's We're told by the province they're here. What we can control is how they're done in our neighborhoods with whatever we are deciding around this horseshoe. Um, do we want affordable housing here in the city of Woodstock? I think all of us have said yes. I don't know how else we can do something quicker and easier than being able to have smaller apartments accessible within our own homes or accessory structures. I don't see any other way that moving forward that our families can live here if we don't find more ways or more apartments and living spaces. I'm sitting that way right now with my own children, my own mother, when I was looking for an apartment for her. Luckily, we got lucky and she, we found one in Interkit for it, fairly close, but still those challenges have been there. I live in Woodstock for a reason as well, and I want my family to live here. I need more housing for families, our families, to live here. And ARUs, I think, are a way that without costing a fortune, somebody like the delegation earlier can go ahead, put an apartment in, and offer that out to the public. I think that is fantastic. As far as heights go, um, I initially was thinking to go higher than six meters in my head. I, I'm but after good discussions, uh, I understand that uh, with height restrictions and the way it all works, we could fit one full apartment above a garage if we make it a recommendation from council or part of our policy is having six meters. We're still keeping parking as a requirement. So a lot of places will still not be able to have air use, but if we we're able to pass this today, I think we can get a few more of these in. There's still other restrictions than just this. And I would encourage Mr. Gilbert, if this is successful to come back with recommendations and of course, looking at neighborhoods and privacies and everything else. Um, I, I've said it before, I'm in favor of air use. Uh, it's the most common thing I hear in my office when it comes to housing is there's nowhere to live. I was at WCI just this morning 
and I got grade 12s complaining about looking, going to university and the, the cost of apartments and schooling and everything else. And they're talking about having to live at home and drive back and forth because they can't afford to find a place. And it's supply and demand, people. We need more apartments. It's plain and simple. If we want prices to come down, we need more variety. And, and for that reason, I'm, I'm certainly in favor of this. I, I would be in favor of a little bit more to try to encourage them, but I recognize parking right now is such a tight thing here. And I, I'm suggesting we keep parking as a restriction uh, until we can figure out other parking areas within the city of Woodstock, but I'm certainly in support of this motion. And with that, if there's nobody else, uh, yeah, I know it's a recorded vote, but just- yeah, I just had a comment because yep. you referred to something I said. So. I looked today, there's 95 available apartments in Woodstock and that's on one site. So you know, I'm seeing for rent signs everywhere. I follow all the economy stuff going on and all the podcasts and everything is saying that the rental market is about to implode because the, this all started with the immigration as I said all along and the, and the feds have stopped the immigration. So um, this need for the housing, it started with Toronto and I can say it all along, it's not a Woodstock problem, it's a Toronto problem. So what I'm voting against is the increase on the um, the garages. I mean, you got to think about what you're doing. And I just, I cannot support it. And the comment about affordability, well, who benefits from these ARs? So what happens is real estate developers and landlords buy up these small houses and they turn them into rentals. So what happens? Housing is unaffordable for a family that's trying to find an affordable housing. So it's, it's you know, you can say one thing, but the other thing is happening. So I think, I think we got to remember this is Woodstock. And again, I'll remind council, we're not voting here on ARUs. That's here. It is really the height. And I guess we're also talking about the gross floor area, according to the motion. Okay. Any other further discussions here or questions? I'll turn it over to the clerk. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. The motion was moved by Councillor Leatherbarrow. So we'll start with you, Councillor Leatherbarrow. Yes. Councillor Martin. Yes. Councillor Schattenberg. No. Councillor Tate. No. Councillor Wismer Van Meer. Yes. Mayor Accioni. Yes. And Councillor Lauder. No. That motion carries four to three. Okay. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, next up, we have consideration of correspondence. 10A, update Safe and Well Oxford Steering Committee. Councillor Leatherborough. Moved by myself that Woodstock City Council received the correspondence from the Safe and Well Oxford Steering Committee regarding current priorities initiatives as information. Thank you. Do we have a seconder? Councillor Wismer Van Meer. Discussion? Councillor Leatherwell. Um, Councillor Martin sits on this committee and I attended one. So just uh, for the general public and my colleagues, if you want to attend one, uh, Monday, April 22nd at 10 a.m., Monday, May 27th at 10 a.m., Monday, June 24th at 10 a.m. Um, it is nice to sit in and listen to see what the County of Oxford is doing, which um, obviously overlaps what's happening in the city of Woodstock, not double dipping, overlapping and working together. So uh, I was happy to see this in our agenda package. Thank you. Anyone else? Councillor Martin. Yeah, I'll just add to that, uh, Councillor Mayor Accioni, pardon me, uh, that, you know, in our strategic plan, we talk about working together to create, uh, you know, a wide range of services with uh, other other organizations. I hope that this is helpful information. I hope that even just the minutes popping up uh, from Safe and Well onto our agenda keeps everybody in the loop on uh, opportunities and challenges. Uh, and don't ever hesitate to uh, to attend, as Councillor Leatherborough said, uh, or to ask questions uh, of staff on this, because um, it is uh, it's one of those freight trains where it's very hard to get things moving forward. But once the wheels start going, we're starting to see some progress. Uh, so uh, yeah, hope this information is valuable to people. Thank you. Anyone else? I just want to basically echo those comments. I, I certainly am, am happy to see these here. 
uh, reading the minutes of those meetings is very informative. I really like what's going on. They really do work hand in hand to what we're doing here as a city. So I encourage that committee to continue forward and, and working together. And with that, I'll call the vote. All those in favor? None opposed. Next up, 10B, 2024 IG Wealth Management Walk for Alzheimer's. Uh, Councillor Martin. Thank you, Mayor Accioni. That Woodstock City Council approves the request from the Alzheimer's Society to display a two-sided advertising road sign from April 25th to May 25th, 2024 at the corner of Juliana Drive and Finkel Street. Thank you. Do we have a seconder? Councillor Lauder, discussion? Seeing none, uh, I'd just like to say that this is fantastic. I love seeing this coming back. Um, I'm going by memory here. I apologize if I have this wrong. I think this is the 23rd run. This has been a long-standing run for a long time. And uh, mark your calendars and get ready to get out there and support somebody if you can't walk or run yourself on May, May 25th. With that, I'll call the vote. All those in favor? None opposed. That's carried. Next up. 10.C, Southwestern Public Health Actions to Reduce Alcohol. Looking for a motion on the floor? Councillor Martin. Uh, thank you, Mayor Accioni. That Woodstock City Council refer the correspondence from Southwestern Public Health regarding the Actions to Reduce Alcohol Related Harms Report to staff for a report on suggested updates to Council Policy PR010, municipal alcohol policy, as well as the potential introduction of additional policies and bylaws to further address alcohol-related risk and harm in the community. Thank you. Is there a seconder on that motion? Councillor Leatherborough, discussion? Councillor Lauder? I just have a question through uh, you, um, Maratione, to uh, Mr. Connors. Um, have have we had uh, any related issues, uh, alcohol, um, in, in any of our facilities? Uh, Your Worship, through to the Councillor's question. Um, we have had a few uh, incidents uh, regarding the Blue Line uh, Club at the community complex during the Navy Vets game. Um, however, we have had more um, alcohol incidents uh, during Navy Vets games with underage folks bringing alcohol to the event. So th th that has been uh, really the only alcohol um, issues we, we, we've had is, is around that. Thank you. Any other discussion or questions? Um, and I'm just gonna throw this out there. It's not really directed at anyone, but I'm trying to decide what we're doing here with this motion. Are we using staff time? Do we think alcohol, alcohol consumption here in the city is an issue? I'm just always hesitant of, of wasting staff time if we don't see there being an issue. So I'm gonna throw that out. I think I saw Councillor Tate first. Uh, through the chair, I had the same um, thing. So I'm not supporting the motion because I was gonna receive the information. We have a really good policy and yes, I mean, alcohol consumption is a choice and obviously you know there's health related issues but it's the same with smoking and everything else and it gets to the point um do you turn into like a nanny state and how much do you control so you have to give um, adults responsibility um themselves so we do have a really good policy and i know the province is changing some things so i think it would be redundant for staff to do a report and then the pol then the province comes and changes it so um completely the same thought that you have so i'm not going to support the motion okay thank you i guess uh councillor martin next thank you mary so i guess that that was my thinking that given that the uh the province is uh bringing in an intention to increase access to alcohol in uh, alcohol sales in more retail locations, uh, that it is the opportunity to take a quick look at the policy. Just like our smoke-free policy has uh, adapted and changed over the years of cannabis uh, and so on. So uh, it's just the opportunity to take a look at, are there any ways that we should be fine tuning our policies and bylaws, not just for city owned facilities, but just the access uh, to alcohol, given that that is changing from purely a, an LCBO and a beer store 
uh, location to, uh, to other locations. So uh, just looking to take a quick look at it and see if there are any uh, recommendations for us to consider. Okay, thank you. And Councillor Schoenberg? Yeah, through to the mayor, my, uh, my motion would have stopped at the word policy. So it has said report to staff for a report on suggested updates to county uh, council policy PR010 municipal alcohol policy and just sort of stop uh, right dead there because um, I was talking to uh, Mr. Connors earlier and one of the things he had suggested that uh, maybe through through special events and through other things happening in Southside Park and other venues in the city of Woodstock, maybe there was a time to sort of update locationals and update some of the wording to the, to the policy that I think was written in 2017, the current policy, and to um, keep the focus specifically on that. Uh, it, it's very difficult, for example, and again, I don't want to sound hypocritical by saying I do the beer garden at Calapalooza in Canada Day for the Lions Club, but how many people would go into Southside Park, for example, and it's going to be like a family picnic or, or some sort of a, a reunion of whatever sort, and then they sit down inside a pavilion, and, and what comes out of the coolers when, the, when they literally do not have permission or a liquor license to, to do such? And again, you don't want to sort of create, as you'd mentioned before, sort of a, a nanny uh, environment for the for the community. But I, I think, do think the city of Woodstock has to maybe update some of its uh, locationals to based on where some of the even public events are, are taking place, like Museum Square is sort of a, a newish venue for, for things like uh, uh, cultural canvas. Thank you, Councillor Leatherwell. Through your worship, I hate to put anyone on the spot, but do we know or maybe I can pull it up, but when the last time it was looked at or revised, 2017? 2017? It was yeah. mentioned by Councillor Schattenberg, if that's factual, I'm not sure. Okay, yeah. Sorry, so, so 2017, so fairly recently, not, not yesterday, but... 2017. So um, if this motion fails, then my question is to Councillor Schattenberg. I didn't quite hear you. You would re read and stop it at um, Council Policy PR 0101. Zero, or if you could just repeat what you were planning on saying, I'm just a bit confused. Well, basically the motion would be the same, but I would stop at the word policy. So the last sentence would be report to staff for a report on suggested uh, updates to council uh, PR 010 uh, bylaw municipal alcohol policy and leave it at that to see if there's gonna be any, any updates, um, whether they be more stringent or, or, or more loose or more vague or whatever to, to sort of update what the current uh, rules and bylaws might be, even with the AGCO um, having th their guidelines uh, changing on a fairly regular basis as to what you're allowed and what you're not allowed to do in certain uh, venues. So if I may, Your Worship, would Councilor Schattenberg, would you be interested in making an amendment? Friendly amendment? Sure, unless we want to see if that first uh, motion fails. I think I'm going to suggest at this point, just see where we go with this motion, and then I'll ask for a new motion on the floor if, if it does not uh, go forward, if that's okay, just to simplify things. Because I think... Um, I think we got to be very cautious. We know changes are coming. I just remind council, changes are coming. And I, I just hate to see staff time wasted. Now, if we ask them for a report of any kind, knowing it's going to change. The, the access to alcohol is going to change. So my only suggestion would be to kind of hold off if we want to report let's wait to see what those changes are and then how they may affect us as a city would be my only recommendations and thoughts um if if that's wish of council of course uh, councilor lauder thank you and i agree with the, what you're saying i hate to see staff doing having to do a full report but i'm sure there's some tweaks like the fourth floor of the art gallery when it's finished to be added to there. So I'm sure there's there's tweaks to be done. And, uh, it, and I don't think they have to do a full report, but uh, see where the where the vote goes. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Anyone else? So right now, just for anybody watching at home, we're voting on the complete motion that was read by Councillor Martin to uh, 
look at the entire policy and everything. Uh, any questions before I, I call the vote? Seeing that, I'll call the vote. All those in favor? Opposed? Okay, that does fail. Uh, looking for a new motion on the floor. Councillor Tate. I will move that Woodstock City Council receive the correspondence from Southwestern Public Health regarding actions to reduce alcohol-related harms report as information. Okay, thank you. Is there a seconder? Councillor Wismer Van Meer, discussion? Councillor Tate? Um, just, a, I mean, the clerk can comment through the chair, the clerk can comment on this, but I assume that once the changes come from the province, the clerk's department will be doing a report anyways to council. Would that not happen once the changes come? Because it, it's going to affect municipality uh your worship through to the counselor's question i think a review of the policy is required regardless because as already mentioned we need to look at some of the locations so while we're doing that review of the locations we would do a fulsome review of this particular policy anyways if we're if we're going to bring that to council on um, the fourth floor of the art gallery was mentioned in a couple of other locations so we would bring a full report back thank you any further questions or discussion? Seeing none, I'll call the vote. All those in favor? None opposed. That is carried. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have 10D, Councillor Lauder, requested following correspondence. Councillor Lauder. Thank you. I'll move that Woodstock City Council supports the resolution from the Township of Marna calling on the province of Ontario to provide equivalent represent, representative operating budget funding to all Ontario municipalities, as was provided to the City of Toronto, and further that the resolution be circulated to the Township of Am Amara. And the Honourable Doug Ford, Premier of Ontario, the Honourable Paul Calandra, uh, Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, and, and the Honourable Arnie Hardiman. Oxford MPP. Yes, um, with this resolution, I'm requesting support for the request from the Township of Armaranth. Um, as we found out in our recent budget, we are faced with high increases in our operational budget in order to meet the needs of our community. Even though not all operational budgets have the same needs as Toronto, but as the resolution indicates, they have the lowest tax rate in the province. But that does not go to say that other municipalities within the pro province are faced with the same pressures, just as a small in a smaller scale. I think this is a fair request that all municipalities should be treated equally. Thank you. Thank you. Any further discussion? Councillor Martin. Uh, thank you, Mayor Chony. Thank you for bringing this forward. Councillor Lauder, fully support this. I think um, when one municipality out of 444 receives special treatment, the rest of us and every uh, resident uh, that pays their tax bill uh, ends up footing the bill for that one special treatment. And so um, looking for some equal, uh, equal treatment for us all. Yes, thank you. Anyone else? Again, I'm just going to echo that. That's exactly what I was going to say. I, I feel that we are looked at as uh, secondaries when it comes to a lot of these kind of rebates and, and programs, the funding that comes from the province and federally uh, towards the GTA and really anything to make sure they're aware and they hear us as smaller municipalities that we need help as well. So I thank Councillor Lauder for bringing this forward. And with that, if nobody else has anything, I'll call the vote. All those in favor? That's none opposed. That is carried. Next up, we have uh, Councillor Schadenberg's requested following correspondence. Councillor Schadenberg. Did too. My apologies. My apologies. Yeah. Councillor Wismer Van Meer. <laughs> I will forgive you. 
<laughs> um, that Woodstock City Council supports the resolution from the town of Fort Erie requesting the province of Ontario to amend the deadline of subsection 2716 of the Ontario Heritage Act and further that this resolution be circulated to the township of Fort Erie, the Honorable Doug Ford, Premier of Ontario, the Honorable Michael Ford, Minister of Citizenship and Multiculturalism, and the Honorable Ernie Hardiman, Oxford MPP. Thank you. Seconded by Councillor Schadenberg. Would you like discussion? Councillor Wismer Van Meer, and again, my apologies. No problem, thank you. Um, I'm just gonna make a couple of comments. As um, some may know, I sit on the Heritage Advisory Committee with um, as the council representative. And um, in speaking with them, when this came across our desk, I asked them for some input and there was a unanimous uproar of, yes, please bring this forward. Um, it's something that we've been discussing in this past year and a half already. Um, right now in Woodstock, we have approximately 40 properties that um, are being looked at to be designated heritage. It doesn't mean that all of them are going to be, doesn't mean that all of them are gonna go through. It is a bit of a long process. Um, it does have a cost to it. Um, the few years of COVID definitely changed things as well. Um, but I think a, a, one of the major things that stuck out to me from um, speaking to the chair of the committee, Peter Epler, was that this is a volunteer group of people that are running the Heritage Advisory Committee. So it is a very cumbersome job for them to go through this and to look at all the properties and to um, prioritize which ones go at the top of the list. Um, and they've, we've been doing that. We've been looking at properties and trying to determine which ones are going to be the ones to look at first. But when we're under the deadline of the end of this year to um, have these designated, which is pretty much impossible if you look at the timeline of getting something designated. Um, there's a lot of properties that are at risk and that does include green space, um, trees even, as well as memorials, um, you know, memorial plates and um, properties and spaces throughout our city. So as much as I know some people may be hesitant about heritage and having a property designated heritage and being told that your property could be this and some people feel like it's a forced um, decision which is not always the case people have the ability to to oppose that um, we do run the risk of losing some great properties to be designated to heritage if we can't get this extended to 2030 so on behalf of the heritage advisor committee i'm hoping that council will support this and i'm hoping that uh, folks within our community that are passionate about heritage also consider um, writing a, a writing a letter sending an email making a phone call to um, our mpp ernie hardiman as well Thank you. Any further discussion? I'll just add uh, my my term during 2014 to 2018, I was on that committee and that's the one committee that really opened my eyes to how much history we have here in the city of Woodstock. So um, please say hi to everybody. That's a, that's a great committee. And with that, I'll call the vote. All those in favor? None opposed. That is carried. Now moving along. 10F, Councillor Schattenberg's made uh, uh, a request of the following correspondence. Councillor Schattenberg. Yeah, I make a motion that the Woodstock City Council supports the resolutions from Northumberland County and Prince Edward County regarding support for a review of the Ontario Works and the Ontario Disability Support Program financial assistance rates. And for that, this resolution be circulated to Northumberland County, Prince Edward County, the Honorable Doug Ford, Premier of Ontario, the Honorable Michael Parse, Minister of Children, Community and Social Services, the Honorable Paul Calandra, Minister of Minis Municipal Affairs and Housing, the Honorable Sylvia Jones, Minister of Health, and the uh, couple more, David Pacini, Minister of Labor and Immigration, Training and Skills Development, the Honorable Ernie Hardiman, Oxford MPP, the Association of Municipalities of Ontario, the Ontario Municipal Sur Social Services Association, and of course, Oxford County Council. Thank you. Do we have a seconder? Councillor Martin. Discussion? Councillor Schoenberg? Just looking online at some of the rates that are available for, for people who are uh, certainly certainly in need, whether they have employable skills or don't have employable skills, or whether or not they're... The numbers come out as being... For a single person, Ontario Works, you're eligible for $733 a month. And so to give you an example, in 2024, you have to go from September 27th to October 31st, based on when the payment days are, to be eligible for your 733 And that's, 
that number just is extremely, extremely low. And ODSP is 1,308 per month for a, uh, for a single person. It really is time they talk about livable wages, but you also talk about just living in general to improve uh, some of these numbers in, in, the, in the province of Ontario for what uh, folks should be eligible for. Thank you, Councillor Martin. Thank you, Mayor Accioni, and thank you, Councillor Shanberg, for uh, bringing this uh, bringing this forward. You beat me to the punch. I was uh, in line to, to bring it forward, but I was gra gathering some information. I had four points. Um, as you've pointed out, these social assistance rates are not sufficient to support households. Uh, this has been a long time topic uh, with very little movement uh, after a lot of advocacy efforts. Um, while the province um, has minimally incre increased ODSP rates, um, they have refused to increase Ontario, or, yeah, Ontario Works OW rates um, because our, our current government sees OW uh, recipients as all being eligible workers and sees it as a temporary measure. And we know that for some, it is not a short-term temporary measure. Uh, and so fully support, thank you again for bringing it forward, uh, that it is time for an increase. As we look at so many of the social needs in our community, if these rates were increased, it would go a long way to mitigating many of the challenges that people are facing on food security, housing, uh, mental health, and so many of the other challenges that we see. Uh, so that's one of the reasons why I uh, support this motion. Okay, thank you. Any other discussion? Seeing none, I'll call the vote. All those in favor? None opposed. That's carried. So we do not have any staff presentations, no mayor's reports today, no councillor reports or department. Uh, we do have some department reports. Uh, so we're going to jump down to economic development at uh, 14E1, proposed sale of city-owned industrial land. Councillor Leatherborough. Moved by myself that Woodstock City Council authorized the mayor and clerk to sign an agreement of purchase and sale with the Gara Group for the purchase of 8.3 acres of city-owned industrial land on Elias Street and that the necessary bylaw be read. Thank you. Seconded by Councillor Lauder. Discussion? Councillor Lauder? Mr. Ham, go through to Mr. Hammond. Would he like to speak to this? Yeah, br briefly. I believe I've said this here before, but this is a good news story. Uh, another new company moving into Woodstock. They've actually uh, been in Woodstock since the beginning of this year. They bought an existing new build over on Griffin Way, um, but they are a growing company. They're about 15 years old, growing quite quickly. Um, so we're happy that they picked Woodstock to secure their future growth. Uh, in the report, I mentioned their tier two, tier three auto parts supplier, which means they don't supply the automakers directly. So they don't supply GM or Ford, uh, Toyota directly. Rather, they supply the people that make parts uh, that go there. So it's an exciting opportunity. Uh, unique thing about this company, it's uh, certified minority and female owned. Um, so it's a, it's a family business. It's growing and uh, we hope we expect great things out of them. Thank you for that. It's certainly great news as one that does have the opportunity to go around to see different businesses. I love seeing what is made here in the city of Woodstock. I'm so proud and what we do with our economic development. So thank you for your team to keep doing that and keep introducing people to the city because we certainly welcome them. Uh, Councillor Schattenberg. Maybe just a reminder for those that might be watching this to take a look at the report because it lists a, a nice long list of international companies that they will be supporting parts for. And the one that jumps off the page for me, besides some of the recognizable names, is Marwood International. People might not realize there's six locations for Marwood, different six different factories, just in Oxford County for Marwood. Uh, so they're, they're, they're quite an important uh, role and if they're going to be uh, supplying parts for, for Marwood's uh, construction of further parts as a tier two, that's very important. Yes, thank you. Anything else or any other questions before I call the vote? In that case, all those in favor? And that is carried. Thank you very much to the Garrett Group. Uh, next up, we will jump to fire services at 14I.1, repealing fire service municipal bylaws and policies. Looking for a motion, Councillor Lauder, seconded by Councillor Leatherborough. Thank you. I'll move that Woodstock City Council repeal Municipal Code Chapter 314, Farm Mutual Aid, and Municipal Code Chapter 729, 
fire extinguishing systems installation and that the necessary bylaw be read. And further that city council re repeal council policies F001, fire department notifying other emergency departments, F, F, F002, fire services beyond city limits, F003, ice and water rescue, and F005, attendance at Ontario Fire College general level course. Thank you. And I do see the fire chief is here with his uh, file open and ready. I will say from the public, I did get a couple of questions on this one. We are not getting rid of our fire department. We're not doing anything major. So I'm going to ask the chief if it's okay with council to come forward and just tell everybody at home in a very summary way what we're doing here. <laughs> Thanks, chief. Thank you very much for the invite. No, I'm not closing myself out of a job. So um, the intent of this report is just doing a bit of a house cleaning uh, within, with respect to the municipal bylaws and policies that apply to the fire department. Uh, as pointed out in the report um, a few years ago, uh, the Woodstock City Council approved the fire department regulations bylaw, which was a consolidation and an expansion of the regulations that we operate underneath of some of the um, rights and uh, activities that we can do. And what was, I guess, at that time not caught that uh, they had included within the regulation that was approved at that time were current bylaws in place that were then beca became duplicated. So by taking the opportunity to go through and remove some of those, it does cl uh, clean up some things so there aren't any opportunities for conflict. So as was pointed out with respect to the mutual aid uh, bylaw that's there, that is covered within the new regulation and actually does expand to allow us to be included in any uh, provincially or federally uh, based mutual aid agreements. Council has also already approved us to be included with that. Uh, we do also look at uh, some of the policies that were in place that council had. Uh, they were making references to facilities or services that are no longer applicable here within the county or within the city. Um, one applied to the uh, former Ontario Regional Centre property. That was the maintain the uh, alarm city for it. Well, we don't operate alarms through our buildings anymore. And well, the ORC is no longer here, so we don't need to have that. And our training facility uh, that we utilized through the province, the Ontario Fire College, they closed that up a number of years ago. So again, it's a policy that's not needed to be there. Others, as pointed out, underneath of the fire extinguishing, when that was put in place, there weren't regulations underneath of both the building code and the fire code that provided some direction for, uh, pardon me, for requirements and support on that. That has since been corrected through both building codes, fire codes, and national codes there. So again, it allows us a more stringent opportunity to address that without being bogged down by municipal policies or bylaws. So strictly a house cleaning issue here. Thank you very much. And that's basically what I summarized for anybody that asked. <laughs> Any questions of council or discussion? Councillor Leatherborough. Through your worship. Uh, thank you, Mr. Slager. Just a comment. Seeing as we were just talking about heritage, we will now bid farewell to a policy from 1989. So I thought it was worth mentioning, and I too read this report as housekeeping. Um, and I didn't ask you this question before the meeting, but how long does this type of activity, if you will, take to identify which ones are outdated, don't need, those kinds of things? Um, your Worship, through to the question. Uh, some of those opportunities, it depends on when it gets brought to our attention that the policies might be in existence or a bylaw is there. Um, we don't have an extensive list of bylaws that every once in a while we take a scan through and be like, well, what is this? And it gets brought to our attention either through other members of the city or just through the members of the public uh, identifying that there might be the potential conflict and we look to see how we can correct it. Thank you. Any other questions or comments of council? Thank you, Chief. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. And with that, I'll call the vote. All those in favor? None opposed. That is carried. So nothing from public works or IT. So we do get into special committee and advisory task force reports. And of course, we have the 2024 community grant program. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, so looking for a motion at 15A. 
on the community grants. Councillor Martin. Thank you, Mayor Accioni. That in accordance with community grants policy GA003, Woodstock City Council allocates the following grants for the year 2024. Big Brothers Big Sisters, Voxer County, $5,000. Cycles for Life of Supportive Transitional Living, $1,400. Day Spring Pregnancy and Family Support Center, $5,000. The Friendly City Parent Student Council of Taekwondo, $1,200. Ingamo Family Homes, $3,500. K to K Productions, Visto Performing Arts Camp, 2,900. K to K Productions, Access to Musical Theater Performances, 2,300. Operation Sharing, $10,000. Oxford Caribbean Canadian Association, $5,000. Oxford County Branch of Ontario Ancestors, $1,000. Oxford County Trails Council, $1,850. Rotary Club of Woodstock for the Dragon Boat Festival, $5,000. Rotary Club of Woodstock for the Festival of Music, uh, $5,000. STEM Camp, uh, $4,500. Theatre Woodstock on behalf of Stages Youth Theatre, $3,500. Woodstock and District Development Services, $5,000. Woodstock Badminton Club, $3,000. The Woodstock Kitten Nursery and Rescue, $3,190. The Woodstock Lawn Bowling Club, $3,000. Woodstock Minor Ball Association, $3,600. Woodstock Special Olympics, Olympics $5,000. Woodstock Triathlon Club for Kids Do Committee, $1,000. Very good. Uh, looking for a seconder. Thank you. Councillor Tate. Discussion? Councillor Schoenberg? Yeah, maybe just a comment. It's amazing that about half of these are, are strictly for youth groups and youth associations, everything from the badminton club to minor ball. You know, again, if you read on the agenda what, what they are. Um, the one I wanted to sort of point out was that the uh, Rotary Club of Woodstock Festival of Music has literally been going on, I think, forever. And I know Brian Jackson, well as do the main coordinator or convener uh, for that. And it's April 2nd to 17th this year with the uh, stars of the festival concert being uh, April 24th at 7 p.m. And they do so much work on that. Uh, and again, that's a youth uh, activity. Yes, thank you. Councillor Tate. Yeah, through the chair, I was just going to make the same comment. Really happy to see that um, youth is more than half of the grants, and it's I'm sure it's very difficult. I've always said that. I wouldn't want to sit on that committee because I don't know how I would choose, but um, good job. Councillor Martin. Well, if you'd like some insight into sitting on the committee, um, and I do have that privilege, um, and so thank you, Mayor Accioni, for assigning me to that committee. Um, this year, so this revenue for uh, for most people understand that this uh, comes from there's a portion of the slots revenue comes to the city and a portion of that revenue is allocated towards grants. Uh, so last year in 2023, the total amount of requested funds was uh, $271,000, just for some perspective. In this first intake, this was the binder, the requests were $245,000. Uh, and out of the allocation from this year's slots revenue, we had $140,000 to work with, and that's for the whole year. So it is a challenge, but I will say uh, this is a committee that works incredibly well together. Mara Chionia, you sat in with us on the last intake. Uh, it, is a, it is a committee that really balances each other out very well, and uh, we're able to go through this binder in um, a very methodical and yet... Um, I'll, I'll call them very gracious, uh, my, my co-colleagues on that committee way uh, of going through them. And so I do appreciate that you've pointed out that a lot of these uh, grants are going towards youth organizations, but there were a lot of applications dealing with social issues, specifically around the prevention uh, and, and, and addressing future needs and not just reaction to existing needs. And so um, between those two, uh, I would say that it was a delight for the community to be able to allocate these funds uh, to these recipients should council choose to approve this motion. Yes, thank you. And I, so the committee knows I would have been there. Unfortunately, I was away on holidays. I did get a copy of that. And I did half jokingly ask if I can attend it virtually, but I was told it probably wouldn't be best. So it wouldn't work out well. But I, I really want to say, and I'll come to you, Councillor Lauder, I'm not going to finish up yet, but I just want to thank the committee because I do know how tough this is to go through and kind of 
go with your heartstrings to so many different directions when you know you've only got so much to play with. So thanks to everybody. Councillor Lauder. I have to echo the same and thanks for being on that committee and going through it. I've been on it uh, a couple of terms and I know how hard it is. So uh, thank you and thanks to the committee for all the work that uh, they've done on it. So thank you. I just want to quickly do a big thank you to all the organizations that are doing what you're doing. We apologize, I think, as a council and as a city that we can't support everybody that we want to but we certainly recognize those that are doing everything you can with the resources you have and please continue to keep applying and, and we'll assist if the opportunity arises, but to thank everybody as well, because there's a lot of great organizations out there. Uh, any other comments or questions before I call the vote? All those in favor? Thank you, that is carried. Again, thank you very much to the entire committee. That's a very tough one. So we've bumped ahead 15B, the Canada Day Waste Audit already. So that has been done for those watching at home. Uh, so let's move on. No notices of motion, but we do have new business. Councillor Lauder. Thank you. I'll move that. Whereas MHART Mental Health Engagement and Response Team a joint project that includes the MHA of Thames Valley is a program aimed at helping people experiencing mental health crisis by pairing police officers with mental health clinic clinicians. Can't say that word. And whereas this provincial funding provides increased service helps level to help police and local health and social services better focus their resources, but more importantly, helps connect people in crisis with appropriate mental health supports. And whereas the Ontario government recognized the needs for this, this service and provided $118,648 in fund to Oxford County in the fall of 2023, as part of the Mobile Crisis Rapid Response Team MCRT Enhancement Grant. And whereas this funding was shared equally with communities across Oxford, regardless of population distribution. And whereas additional funding dedicated to the MHART program, specifically with the Woodstock Police Services, would be advantageous to increase this much needed service in the Woodstock community. And whereas the program has been in existence in Woodstock since 2018, providing a most valuable service in our community, but due to lack of funding, cannot realize the full extent of benefits and savings this program can provide. Now, therefore, be it resolved that Woodstock City Council request additional funding for this valuable service in order to provide additional MHART hours, either through the MHART program or the Mobile Crisis Rapid Response Team and Enhancement Grant for the Woodstock Police Services to better service those in need in our community. And further that this resolution be circulated to the Honorable Doug Ford, Premier of Ontario, the Honorable Michael Kirsner, Solicitor General of Ontario, the Honorable Ernie Hardiman, Oxford MPP, and the Canadian Mental Health Association, Thames Valley Addiction and Mental Health Services. Thank you. Looking for a seconder on the motion, Councillor Tate. Discussion, Councillor Lauder. Yes, I, I've spoken with the police chief about the MHAR program, and he has confirmed with me the importance of the partnership in providing this need, needed program, but certainly additional personnel would be welcomed. In this resolution, I'm requesting the support of council to forward to the province for consideration of additional funding through CMHA to flow through the MHAR program or for additional funding for the Mobile Crisis Rapid Response Team Enhancement Grant of which the Woodstock Police Services received a very small portion of the recent grant. Thank you. Thank you. Any other discussion, Councillor Tate? Through the chair, just a comment. I fully support sending this to the province. I don't have a lot of faith that we will get money, but um, this is a program um, that we're all familiar with that it's unfortunate that the funding was so small that came to Oxford County and Tilsonburg needed quite a bit of it. So it ended up in Tilsonburg, but um, I, it, it would be nice if the province had people on the ground in communities 
and understand where the money's being spent. And so some programs, money's well spent, some is not. Um, I'm sure they get so many of these letters. I don't know where they go, but um, maybe if we even advocate harder on our MPP that we can get some money. Yes, thank you. Councillor Martin. Uh, thank you, Mayor Atchoni. Um, the, the motion is to request additional funding. Do we have an idea of what is a reasonable ask? Um, and, you know, is there, a, is there a, a, a per person? Is it two people? Is there an equivalent that we're um, intentionally asking for? I don't know if the police chief has some data on that, of what would really be meaningful for the city of Woodstock? Not sure I can really answer that myself. I don't know if a, a dollar amount was uh, ever recognized. And I'm looking at Councillor Lauder right now who's shaking her head. Um, and I'll actually put this over to Councillor Leatherborough because I know she did a lot of work with a previous motion um, and you had some dollar figures involved in that. So I'm, I'm gonna assume knowing yourself and how much work you would put into a motion that um, was that a hundred Fifty thousand dollars was that what you had uh, through your worship? So when I contacted CMHA, they said it was just shy of ninety thousand for one full time uh, clinician. So obviously, um, wherever the money flows from, it would be nice to have annualized funding because, as we all know, coming off the tails of the community grants, it's it's very challenging to hire humans. Um, so that was ninety thousand per clinician from CMHA. Okay, thank you very much for that. So that would answer that. Councillor Lauder? I'm quite certain that any amount is uh, would certainly be acceptable. Um, and that's why I'm asking for a grant of whatever that they can get. I mean, um, if it's 90,000 or if it's 200,000, it certainly can be used for this program. Uh, Councillor Leatherborough. Um, so through your worship to Councillor Lauder or yourself, because you're Woodstock Police Service Board members, I was curious in terms of data, I have the Woodstock Police Service Board um, budget presentation here, and obviously that's where I had pulled some of the language from the previous motion that we're not debating now. And on page 7 out of 21, that's where the calls for service, unwanted persons, attempt or threats of suicide, all of those numbers. So I was just wondering whether it be through this um, correspondence motion or through the Woodstock Police Service Board if there will be additional advocacy with these types of numbers to kind of set us apart um, and to leverage um, certainly Mr. Hardiman will will see that all of Oxford could use more um, but but just trying to understand which avenue or level of advocacy we can provide these types of, of data to say um, we would like it to come to Woodstock. No, uh, I, I'll answer that one if, you, if you'd like, Councillor Lauder. I certainly believe right now the way this is, this is coming from Council. So this is a, a vote of Council. This is from the City of Woodstock that we would like to see more and we recognize the importance of this program and we would certainly, we require more funding because of the value. So if there's any correspondence back or if they reach back, um, they will typically reach back to my office uh, we'll certainly supply them with any of the data that we have from the Woodstock police if if requested. Um, and that if that answers your question. Yes, just further to that, I was just wondering if wouldn't wouldn't it make sense to just send what we we just approved and those those numbers along with the correspondence. So I suppose it would be, I don't know if the language would be the friendly amendment amendment to add the day the data if this is coming from Woodstock City Council or if you feel comfortable that someone will then follow up with the mayor's office after to say let me see the data fair as Councillor Tate referred to you're not you just never know exactly where some of these go it's certainly um questionable sometimes I can certainly say I'm not shy and I'll certainly speak to any minister I've got the ear of uh, no matter any department uh, in relation to anything going on here in the city of Woodstock. But if council wants to add any additions to this, by all means, I think we have to be a little cautionary, though, if we're going to just provide general information from, say, Woodstock police, only because there's going to be so it could open up other doors of other questions of what really are mental health related, because they're just in general in those reports of, of 
altercations and then we really got to go in deep and it's again boiling down to is that worth that staff's time i'm not quite sure it is unless it's asked for okay councillor water you're comfortable with that answer yeah yes, and i and i think of uh if there's any grants or anything that comes forward to the police they have they will have to fill out those forms and request um according to what the the um forms are asking for i don't think and unless they're coming up with a, a, a funding amount like say for instance like uh the grant for um, the art gallery was there was a, a limit in there and and maybe that's what this grant a, a grant would look like when it came forward for any funding so i think that if it's just this way then um you know we could say we we a thousand dollars and they might not look at it or um I, like if we go over we won't get it so i think if it's left open that it's better so that's just my thought all right thank you any further discussion or questions councillor leatherbro um i'll just add uh to fully support this obviously i had reached out to councillor lauder ahead of um well once it was the notice of motion. Um, and so I do hope that this is received respectfully. And I wanted to mention that um, I shared this with Councillor Lauder and Councillor, or sorry, Mayor Accioni, that the um, City of Guelph, Guelph Police Service on March 12th issued a press release that did identify that their police service board, um, I will quote it as I always do. Uh, During the last fall's budget process, the Guelph Police Service committed to funding the additional crisis worker position for the next four years from a contingency reserve so it's a different acronym but it is essentially an MHART clinician paired with Guelph police in their downtown core um, O'Connell and Ketcher so a police officer and a social uh, agency social worker have heard the argument that police officers should not be responding to mental health calls but both say it's not as simple as that quote I can assess risk but if we need to utilize the mental health act to get someone help the police are the only ones who can do that Ketcher says um, so just a few days into their new joint assignment, both are really already seeing value in the more proactive approach. So I know opinions can run wild around council. Um, I do think when I hear that a social agency has no place in police funding, that is a subjective opinion, which I respect, but I do not agree with based off of what the city of Guelph is doing. So I do hope that eyes are on this correspondence, that money can flow to support Woodstock Police Services. Um, which was the intention of my previous motion. And I thank Councillor Lauder for bringing this forward for Council's support. Thank you. And I'll certainly speak on behalf of the Woodstock Police Board in this case that we look at everything and we'll certainly put those dollars towards where they think best return for the city of Woodstock, no matter where it is. So, uh, and with that, I'll, if there's nobody else, no questions or comments further, I'll look for a vote. All those in favor? That is unanimous. Thank you. That brings us to draft bylaws. Councillor Tate. Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Lauder, that the following bylaws be given a first and second reading, 9674-24, a bylaw to repeal Municipal Code Chapter 314, Fire Mutual Aid, 9675-24, a bylaw to repeal Municipal Code Cap Chapter 729 Fire Extinguishing Systems Installation, 9676-24 bylaw to provide for the sale of certain lands. And that's it. Thank you. Any discussion or questions on those? Seeing none, I'll call the vote. All those in favor? None opposed. Councillor Tate. Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Schattenberg, that the following bylaws be given a third and final reading, 9674-24, 9675-24, and 9676-24. Thank you. Last chance. Any questions or discussions? All those in favor? That is carried. And tonight, because I think I left uh, Councillor Schattenberg last, the last couple of meetings, I'm going to start with Councillor Schattenberg. In uh, junior C hockey, dating back to the Perry Street Arena days, but now in the Southwood Arena days of the Reeves Community Complex, is there anything better than controversy in the playoffs? So the Navy Vets uh, lost in double overtime on Tuesday to New Hamburg by a score of 3-2.
But the vets did score two goals that were both but disallowed. The second one, in my opinion, should have most certainly been allowed. Need needless to say, because there's video on it online. But New Hamburg ended up winning in double overtime 3-2. So they now lead the best of 7-3-1. Next game's Friday at New Hamburg, 7-30, if necessary. Saturday at Woodstock at 7-45, if necessary. For That would be uh, game number uh, game number six. Uh, I want to remind everyone that it's uh, Thursday. It's the time I checked my calendar, it's Thursday. So it's meet as Lions Bingo at Southgate Center. They start calling numbers at 7 p.m., but the doors open at 6 p.m. The Lions Club, of course, uh, raises great money for many, many local uh, charities, and we do this every every Thursday, Lions Bingo at Southgate Center. Last thing I want to mention is uh, tonight at midnight, so you get close to your get close to your iTunes account or whatever your streaming account is, Corey Stewart from Woodstock releases his next new song, One More Day With You is what it's called. And I think it was in Heart FM this morning or tomorrow morning for an interview. He's the uh, son of John and Danielle Stewart of Woodstock, which also makes him the grandson of uh, former Woodstock Mayor Trevor Slater. So that's uh, kind of interesting. So we wish Corey Stewart well with that uh, new song getting released at uh, midnight. Thanks. Thank you very much. We're going to bounce over to Councilor Lauder. Thank you. Uh, just a reminder from the Art Gallery for the upcoming PA Days, April 8th and May 31st for children ages 5 to 12. Creative PA Day programs include art making activities and lessons designed to provide time and space for interactive creativity and social engagement. And the cost is uh, $55. But if you um, are a gallery member, uh, the cost would be $45. And there is uh, before and after care available for an additional $10 a day. That's from 8.30 until 4.30. And thank you. Thank you. Councillor Wismer Van Meer. Thank you. Um, a couple of things just to mention. Um, Runway of Stars is coming up May 2nd. Um, I missed dress rehearsal. I'm uh, lucky to be a part of that event. I going to do my makeup dress rehearsal next week. But um, the event has been uh, held off for a few years because of the pandemic, and it's exciting to have them back. April 18th is the last day to get your tickets. Uh, they're $65, and a couple of the folks from WDDS stopped by, by my office yesterday for, uh, at Big Brothers Big Sisters, and uh, they're very excited for this event. So let's get out and support our friends at WDDS. Um, this month is also Volunteer Appreciation Week, April 14th to the 20th, and I think it's really important um, for not only us as council members, but the community as a whole to take a moment to acknowledge uh, volunteers and the amount of work that they do within our community. Volunteerism is something that I'm very passionate about, and it's something that I think is what makes communities bigger and stronger, and we are very fortunate to have a community full of amazing volunteers, so um not just that week, but every day we should be thanking them for the work they're doing here in our community. Um, I did talk about the Heritage Committee earlier. Uh, we do have a vacancy on that advisory committee now. So uh, you can apply through the City of Woodstock website and the closings for those is Tuesday, April 30th. There's also a vacancy on the Sisters City Committee. So uh, those two uh, committees have spots open for you to apply for. And with the Sister City Committee as well, the Sister City Logo Contest is going on right now. And I believe that one closes on April 10th. So that's next week. And the theme is Sister Cities Enhancing the Quality of Life, Health, and Well-Being of Our Communities. So you can get your logo designs in. And the winner, whether it's a U.S. Um, participant or a Canadian participant, is going to win $500 in their currency. So love to see the creativity out there. So get your submissions in. Thank you for mentioning that. Councillor Leatherborough. Another long weekend is upon us because of the solar eclipse. So if you need solar eclipse sunglasses, head down to the Record Works. They're selling them for $3. They were free um, at last week's uh, late night shopping event downtown, but I missed it. So go on in and uh, pick up some either old or new records as well. And then I have two pieces for Oxford County. So um, as the Oxford County councillors already know, but Oxford County is considering potential changes to the waste collection program that may include a source separated organics program for food waste, green bin program, changes to how often garbage is collected, a limit on the number of garbage bags set out and more. Um, so do head over to oxfordcounty.ca slash speak up um, to provide your feedback till the end of the month. And further to that, um, 
Oxford County Council will also be reviewing and uh, participating in engagement on the next five year child care and early years plan, which I will be following along quite closely. Um, so I do look forward to just continuing to spread information about how to, to get that engagement back. Um, I'm sure it'll be a lengthy process and then County Council will look at it, I believe in November. So that's exciting. And that's all I have for the upcoming long weekend. Another one. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Tate. Yes, and thanks for mentioning the uh, volunteer. Um, so I've been attending the Navy Vets games and they um, did a special presentation to Karen Snyder the other night for over 10 years of work. And it's funny, so I've always gone to Navy Vets games. Probably the last four years I haven't because the kids have gotten older and got back into it because my parents go to every game. And it's all the same people from probably 20 years ago are all still there, all volunteering. So it's incredible. But very interesting, the one night I'm going and I'm talking to my girlfriend from Toronto who's from here and I'm like, oh, there's Craig Van Wees and there's Zona and they're all coming. And she's like, oh, I should have came to the game. They weren't coming to the game. They were going to trivia night for the big brothers, big sisters. And the place was packed and it was lined up. So it was really good to see. So it was a very successful night from what I was told. Um, so, and yes, good luck to the Navy vets. I don't think they will have any appeal to be able to do it, but um, it was a goal. And hopefully they can pull out the next game on Friday. That's it. Last but not least, Councillor Martin. Thank you, Mayor Accioni. Yes, uh, it was a goal twice, I believe. Um, so uh, you might be hearing in the news about uh, measles cases. Um, measles vaccines are available for children uh, up to 18 years of age uh, through Southwestern Public Health. If you're over the age of 18 and you're unsure if you've been vaccinated, uh, talk to your uh, medical provider uh, or reach out to Southwestern Public Health to, to talk about what your options are. Um, we do not have any current cases within the Southwestern Public Health region. That's as of uh, Friday, I think I had that update. Um, but I'm also very pleased to say that uh, there is a new doctor, a new physician, family physician in uh, the city of Woodstock, who I'm sure uh, through, its, through Walmart, um, I know that uh, they've had an enormous response, um, but don't give up. Uh, I believe it is to email the practice um, if you are looking for a physician. And the eclipse has already been mentioned, but I would like to take the opportunity to ensure that you protect your own eye health. Do not look at the moon covering the sun on Monday. Uh, and also those for your, without the glasses, yes, approved glasses, uh, your children, and also to uh, ensure you take care of your furry friends and make sure that they stay indoors. Um, during that time frame, um, because I think it will be interesting. Uh, someone someone referred to it as a once in a lifetime, um, but I actually remember it happening in 1979, uh, grade three. If anyone wants to look that up, what year that was? Um, um, uh, it, it will be uh, spectacular, and it will happen right here in our backyard. So, uh, but just be cautious and careful. Yes, thank you. On that note, uh, I read something on Facebook. Uh, scrolling late in late at night or this morning more or less and um this argument going on about sunglasses why all these people are going out and making a big deal about buying sunglasses sunglasses do not protect your eyes in this case please do not think you're going to put sun just regular sunglasses on your child or yourself and that will do please do not do that uh, i don't often comment that is a comment I did make. Please ask him to go out for $3. In fact, I saw Councillor Leatherborough's post about the $3 one, so I made sure they knew were they available and, uh, and go and get some. So please be the home. Oh, there you go. Councillor Martin <laughs> is showing off some right now. <laughs> we do have some at our house. Um, just going through my list about wasn't what wasn't commented. Most were. Uh, first off, yes, it was a goal. Uh, I was in a meeting till uh, quarter after 10 or else I would have been at the game. Everybody knows I love a good hockey game, but I was getting regular uh, updates from Marcy and I thank her very much because she sent me a message. We scored. And then within seconds, nope, they called it off. And then again, right away, we scored. And again, it was, um, nope, they called that off too. And uh, sh she wasn't happy. Um, so I did see the video now and I agree. I think it's a goal, but. I'm a little biased. I'm the first one to admit. So go vets, go bring it back home. And hopefully we'll see you here Saturday night after uh, you win on Friday. 
Um, curbside brush collection wasn't brought up. I don't believe April 8th to 12th here in the city of Woodstock. Earth Day is April 22nd. Mark that on your calendars. Be involved. Uh, I did want to mention and thank city staff for the Easter egg hunt. Uh, I got home late Friday night um, to make sure from holidays because I didn't want to miss the Easter egg hunt in the morning on Saturday morning. Uh, that was fantastic. And I've got nothing but great comments from the community. So I really want to say thank you staff to all the organizations and to all the volunteers they had that went very, very well. Um, I'm excited for the runway of stars. I know it was mentioned, but I've got Tara again as a partner. I couldn't be more excited. We are going to, uh, if you want to see something funny, watch me dance. I will be doing it on the runway and, and with pride. Uh, and I'd like to just send a quick thank you to the Woodstock Hospital. My 97-year-old uh, Oma is in the hospital right now. She, We're not sure if she's going to come home, unfortunately, but they are keeping her comfortable as much as possible. She's a fighter. I'm hoping to see her home soon, but I just want to say thank you to the Woodstock Hospital because um, they really are treating her well. Uh, and with that, I'll look for an adjournment. Councillor Leatherborough, second by Councillor Wismer Van Meer. All those in favor, we are adjourned. Protect your eyes, everybody. See you next time. Thank you.